Dear ladies and gentlemen, дорогі українці, this is already 22nd episode in our series of conversations of Ukrainians and foreign intellectuals about the war in Ukraine. We're discussing here different angles of Russia's invasion in Ukraine to Ukraine and looking for some answers for the complicated questions about the freedom of expression, cultural dialogues, if they ever possible, and words position on ongoing war. We are doing this to share this knowledge with you, our listeners who are keen to learn more, think deeper, and hear from the original sources. В етері уже 22-й епізод нашої серії розмов поміж українськими та зарубіжними інтелектуалами про війну в Україні. Ми обговорюємо тут різні точки зору вторгнення Росії в Україну і шукаємо відповіді на складні питання про свободу слова, діалоги культур, якщо вони можливі, та світову позицію щодо війни, що триває. Ми робимо це, аби поділитися знаннями з вами, нашими слухачами, які прагнуть дізнатися більше, думати глибше та чути з перших джерел. This is a project of Pan Ukraine, whose entire team stays in Ukraine, besieged by the terror and violence of the continuing invasion of Russian army. We all admire your dedication to spread the truth and uphold the freedom of expression. Це проект Pan Ukraine, команда якого залишається в Україні в облозі терору та насильства триваючого вторгнення російської армії. Ми всі захоплюємося вашою відданістю поширенню правди і захистом свободи вираженого погляду. Today we also fundraise volunteer initiative of Pan Ukraine member and poet Helena Krupp. She purchased drugs and tactical medicine supplies for Fields Hospital, vital for our fighters. She will be grateful to you for any donation. Please find all the details in the comments. Сьогодні ми також збираємо кошти на волонтерську ініціативу членкині Пан Україна, поетки Галини Крук. Вона закуповує ліки та тактичні медикаменти для польових госпіталів, життєво важливі для наших бійців. Будь ласка, знайдіть усі деталі в коментарях. The project is co-hosted by Pan International, which has continued to provide a platform for freedom of expression for those currently under the highest risk. We work under the Pan International Charter. Співорганізатором проєкту є міжнародний ПЕН, який продовжує надавати платформу для свободи вираження поглядів для тих, хто перебуває в групі найвищого ризику. Ми дотримуємося харті міжнародного ПЕН. We are grateful to our partners today, who are Department of Press, Education and Culture of the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine, and traditionally PAN America, the Ukrainian Institute, the Ukrainian Institute London, Ukraine World, the Harvard University Ukrainian Research Institute, and the Harriman Institute at Columbia University. We are streaming today's event to all partners' Facebook pages and additionally to the Prize Award. Сьогодні нашими партнерами є відділ преси, освіти та культури посольства США в Україні, а також традиційно Пен Америка, Український інститут, Український інститут Лондона, Україна Світ, Український науково-дослідний інститут Гарвардського університету та Інститут Гаррімана при Колумбійському університеті. Ми транслюємо сьогоднішню подію на всі партнерські сторінки у Фейсбук та додатково сторінку Vanguard the Price. Захід відбуватиметься англійською мовою. And from Ukrainian side, I'm happy to welcome Vachtan Kebuladze, philosopher, writer and translator, professor of Department of Theoretical and Practical Philosophy at Kiev Tarasovchenko National University, doctor of philosophy. In June 2012, he defended a dissertation on concept of experience in transcendental phenomenology, obtaining an academic degree in Doctor of Philosophy. So the main focus of his academic background is phenomenology. But lately, Vachtan gives a lot of comments on the ongoing Russian aggression in Ukraine, like romanticizing the evil and how the soft power of Russia kills. I really enjoyed your interview from March 28 about what is wrong with Russia, and we shall definitely discuss it today, and your conversation with Volodya Yermolenko about the civilizational difference and the nature of Russian nationalism. You also said quite controversial thing about Pushkin, that he is the same level xenophobe and fascist as any Kremlin propagandist. And I believe that a lot of uh, European intellectuals will absolutely discuss it. And we are holding a lot of different debates if we can cancel Russian culture or it's mostly about underrepresentation of the other cultures, including Ukrainian. And this cultural appropriation of the suppressed cultures by those with imperialistic ambitions. 
So I believe that that will be definitely one of the topic of today's conversation. And Vahtan will hold his conversation with a real expert in Russia, I mean Russian's horn journalist, David Satter, a leading commentator on Russia and the former Soviet Union. He is the author of five books on Russia and the created of a documentary film on the fall of the USSR. His first book, The Age of Delirium, That Decline and Fall of the Soviet Union, which was published back in 1996, was later turned into a documentary film, Age of Delirium, which was also awarded in the Amsterdam Film Festival. He's also the author of the other books with incredible titles, Darkness and Dawn, The Rise of the Russian Criminal State. It was a long time ago, and it never happened anyway, Russia and the communist past. And the Yeltsin and Putin, or the less you know, the better you sleep, Russia's road to terror and dictatorship under Yeltsin and Putin. His most recent work, Never Speak to Strangers and Other Writing from Russia and the Soviet Union, is a collection of more than 40 years of journalism from Russia. And I'm wondering if you would change anything if you had to publish it now in 2022. David Sutter continues to write about Russia for the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal and a lot of other important journals. So I will pass the floor to those two quite sharp but mostly fair in their opinions, gentlemen, and we'll enjoy the conversation. Wishing you a great talk. David, floor is yours. Thank you, Olya. Thank you, Olya. Uh, I want to begin by asking Bakhtang uh, just uh, what is the atmosphere in Kyiv and how what what is the what are the latest developments? How does he see the situation uh, from Kyiv? We're all watching from the outside right now. I want myself want to come to Kyiv, but uh, uh, we it's particularly valuable to hear from people like you. Uh, so, I, so I would say that uh, all day long, uh, it looks like uh, as before the war, yeah? the shops are opened, uh, some restaurants are open too. Uh, the people came back to Kiev, not all people, but many of them, many people from Eastern Ukraine, from the next region, from Kharkiv uh, are coming still. To Kyiv. That's why we can see uh, many people in the streets. But in the night, you know, everything is closed. Yeah, at ten o'clock, uh, Kyiv is empty, uh, and it's it's very strange for me. The center of, of city is empty, and uh, we. I it is it's it's not uh, like before so the first the first months. Um, uh, March was terrible. Yeah, uh, the sound of of their of missile strikes uh, every day. Yeah, um, not not many people in the streets. All all shops and restaurants were closed. Now it's different, but the feeling of the war uh, is just behind our backs. I, I would I would say it's near. You know? We still feel. Yeah. The war, yes. Well, it's, it's 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 certainly a relief to hear that that at least Kiev is coming back to, has come back to life and a tremendous achievement that the capital was defended and the aggression uh, against Kiev again in the north at least seems to seems to have been defeated. Uh, but of course, we're. Uh, definitely now in a situation in which uh, uh, the, the the victory has to be pursued. This is not uh, uh, a situation in which uh, I think it's wise to reward Russia and the Putin regime for their aggression. And uh, my view on the whole situation is that uh, we're we're engaged not just in a war for uh, Ukraine, but also for Russia itself and the future of Russia. Uh, because after all, uh, the events of 2013, the Euromaidan, uh, they were preceded by mass protests in Russia itself in 2011 now, and 2012. Now, those 
protests were brought uh, under control with very, through various means. But general discontent in the whole area with corrupt leaders uh, is uh, a contagious phenomenon. And uh, liberation is also contagious and resistance is also contagious. Uh, if the Russian uh, regime was afraid of the example of Euromaidan, and I believe that this was the reason, by the way, of Akhtang for the uh, seizure of Crimea. Uh, in order, is an absolutely typical operation to distract attention from uh, any threat to the regime. And we saw this in the case of the first Chechen war. We must remember that uh, the first Chechen war was undertaken according to Oleg Lobov, who was an advisor to Yeltsin, uh, because Yeltsin needed a short victorious war to boost his rating. And the second Chechen war was undertaken to, to put Putin in, 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 to make sure that Putin would uh, take office and protect the corruption of Yeltsin. Of course, uh, this was facilitated with the terrorist attacks that were carried out, I'm absolutely certain, by the FSB and blamed on the Chechens. But in that, but the but Euromaidan uh, also presented a threat to the to the corrupt regime in Russia. And it also required a distraction. And that distraction was uh, the seizure of Crimea and then the war that was launched in eastern Ukraine in order to uh, make the West forget about the seizure of, of, of Crimea, among other reasons. So all of this is, uh, all of this shows that the, 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 the Russian regime is very, very sensitive to uh, the effectiveness of war as an instrument of internal policy. They declare war, in order to strengthen the, their corrupt hold on power. And unfortunately, the innocent people are the victims. And what we have now is uh, the same phenomenon uh, because the Crimea effect was wearing off and they became convinced that the, the, the United States was weak after the withdrawal from Afghanistan and would not react, would not react as strongly as they have reacted. But, but it's a contagious, but, but, but the, 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 they know that, that what is happening in Ukraine uh, poses the risk of con contagion in Russia, even though it may not seem this way, but there is a potential in Russia also for uh, revolt against the regime. Uh, many things are just be, be below the surface of consciousness. The regime knows this, and they've acted protectively with this war. At least the, uh, this is how it does, how it seems to me. By the way, uh, about the atmosphere in Kiev now, uh, I hear now the alarm siren, yeah? Oh, is there sirens? Yeah, no, just now. No. Uh, so, um, what can I say? Uh, first of all, uh, it's, it's a great difference between uh, the war in Chechnya and Ukrainian war. Uh, it was terrible, you know, the Russia uh, war in Chechnya, but Chechnya is uh, part of Russian empire. It's part of Ru Russia. Ukraine, the independent state, independent uh, country. And this is a difference, first of all. Uh, but I'm absolutely ag agree with you that uh, Putin, and not only Putin, it's, it's typical for all kinds of Russian state to use the war to legitimize the regime. You know, communists in Afghanistan, for example, or before the communists, the Tsar Ruslan, uh, Russia, you know, it was just the same for me. Uh, but the protests in Russia, I, I don't think that it's uh, the same story. It's the same, the same event, because uh, um, 
the main question for me uh, the, uh, about this protest against what? Yeah. I, Which I, protest, Fabtang, are we talking in, about? In Russia. In Russia. Yeah. You mean the 2011 protests? For, for example. For example. 2011, 2012. Yeah. yeah. For example, probably it was it was uh, it's obviously was the protest against uh, against uh, power against corrupt power, uh, Putin corrupted power. But uh, I think that it uh, wasn't protest against empire. Yeah. That, that, it was that, a protest. I mean, in two thousand and eleven, the the main the 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 main impulse was the falsification of the parliamentary elections. In Absolutely. December 2011, and the announcement that Putin was going to run again as president, as president, that okay. that the, you know, so that you know people saw that this is permanent dictatorship, and yes. I think that uh, the, that that the question of empire is of course connected. But I think that uh, I, I would say uh, very shortly, yeah that Putin is uh, enemy of our presence. Yeah, it's, it's obviously for us, but we, we should understand that the, even the Russian liberals are the enemies of our future. Because Russian liberals do not want to destruct the empire. Yeah. Crimea, for example, this is a, a great question. Navalny said that uh, Crimea, it's, it's Russian territory now. Yeah? Navalny, it's, uh, he's in prison now. He's enemy of Putin, but he's not the enemy of the Russian empire. Vakhtang, I think it's a little bit of a question what we mean when we use the word liberals. Uh, the, you know, obviously, in the true sense, uh, people who, who take these nationalistic or chauvinistic positions in Russia cannot be described as liberals uh, because they can be described as nationalists. They can be described as enemies of corruption, which maybe they are until they become corrupt themselves, of course. But uh, a liberal, liberal attitude in, in the Russian context must mean the readiness to allow the you know self determination for you know, all of the peoples, whether we consider them part of the so called Russian Federation, which is back to not a federation, or whether they they were outside of that structure, which is an arbitrary structure. But the point is, how do people identify themselves? How what do what is the, do they have a sense of their own separate national identity? If they are, then they're a separate nation and they, that needs to be respected. Uh, that, would, that applies to the Chechens, it applies of course to, to Ukrainians, uh, uh, Georgians, Armenians, other peoples who were, I mean, the Soviet Union was not a country in the true sense, in the true national traditional sense. I mean, you, Ukraine is a traditional nation. Russia is a traditional nation. Uh, Georgia is a traditional nation. The Soviet Union is an agglomeration of nations based on a, a mendacious ideology. It's an absolutely artificial structure. And it was shown to be because it had no ability. Once, once it, 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 it inspired no loyalty. Now, uh, I think that that there that this liberal part of the Russian population does exist. I you know I, I've often asked myself you know what how many people are we talking about really? My guess, and this uh, you might not agree with me, but my guess it's somewhere ten to fifteen percent who who hold liberal views. That and I don't mean nationalist views let's say 10% of the population, but they have demonstrated under certain circumstances, their ability to influence the population as a whole. And you know, we have a, a rapidly changing situation here in which uh, uh, the, our hope must be, we must try to do what we can to encourage those forces uh, if it's at all possible. 
so then the question is here yeah, uh, about the Russian liberals. What do they want? And I am not sure that they want the real liberal national state. Uh, it, it, well, it, if I've done, they almost have to want that because if they don't, then they're the, what the, then the result is that they themselves will be re repressed. Uh, there was a very interesting statement by a Russian uh, political scientist who I know, Dmitry Oreshkin, uh, who said that the problem is that people are, are, you know, people who have intellect are suffocating. Now, this was something he said uh, uh, in 2011 when, when I spoke to him. He said the problem is just a, a lack of air. You, you know, everywhere, uh, you know, the, the, this corrupt, lawless, uh, and repressive system limits your ability to be yourself. Uh, to realize yourself as an individual. So why would Russia and Russian liberals cannot want the conditions which will inevitably restore that type of situation? And the only way in which uh, Russia can be free of it is if it does ad adopt a, genu a genuinely different attitude uh, toward uh, other nations toward the rights of other nations. That's fundamental to the gener general project of respecting the individual, which, if, which in Russia is of course very much uh, uh, under threat always. But for me, it's a great question. Is it possible for Russia to be a real liberal state? As for it's, me, a que it's, you know, it's a question, of course, but we have some examples in history. Uh, you know that Russia had hmm? very short very short periods. Cause... Very short, very short periods, very yeah. short periods. Yeah. But but what is it? That you, Russia is facing defeat in Ukraine. We don't know how things are going to play out, of course, and it's foolish to be you know dogmatic. But Russia has already lost. They cannot. There is no outcome. There's no victorious outcome of this war for Russia. It's a question of how much horror are they going to inflict? Uh, but they are going to lose no matter what. Uh, let's hope they can lose uh, without doing just too much damage. They've already done too much damage, but without doing too much more damage. That, that creates the conditions for an entire society to rethink as the there was re, the, re, the process of rethinking such as happened after the Russo-Japanese War, which led to you know, all of the revolutionary turmoil. And it was similar too, because in that war, the, 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 the Russians, Russia has a history of overconfidence and a combination of overconfidence and also lack of preparation. We saw that by the way, in the first Chechen war, where the defense minister, uh, Pavel Grachov, said that he would take Grozny with one parachute regiment in two hours. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, it turned out rather differently. It was the case in the Finnish war. They even were overconfident in their attitude toward Hitler. So this is nothing, this is nothing new, but when there is a decisive defeat and, and then, then there's a, there's a chance at least for reflection about the root causes. And also this regime of Putin is, is incompatible with the kind of country that Russia is capable of becoming. This is not a closed country anymore. Well, now it is, but until recently Russians had experience of the outside world. There was a middle class in Russia. There were there were were people, as we say, there was a group, maybe not the, not a not a big group numerically, but an important group of those who had who, who were capable of serious thought and who were liberal in their ideas. Uh, okay. This. The, so, so this, this, we, this, this regime is, is imposed 
on 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 such a people. And we must remember, you know, if we talk about Putin, this was an act of terror that brought them to power. Uh, As I said, for me, the main question is, is it possible for Russia to be a real liberal national state? As for me, it's, it's impossible because Russia is empire. And do you know this book uh, by Eva Thompson, Russia, uh, Imperial Knowledge? Russia literature and imperialism. Uh, yeah, it's it's very it's very important point in this book, and I, I absolutely agree with this point that Russian Empire has all uh, its colonies in the body of empire. So that's why we do not know why the destruction of empire should stop, and that's why. That's why even the Russian liberals, they afraid yeah, that the destruction of empire should lead to the destruction of Russia itself. It's the first point. The second one, I am not agree with you that Russia is a typical historical political nation. As for me, Russia has not a real political nation, historically. The, the structure of Russian society is the state, and normally it's normally it's a criminal gang, communist gang or Putin gang, and the population. And uh, traditionally, the state uh, look at the population as a resource of the state. The great problem for modern Russia as for me, that the population itself, the people, the Russian people, look at themselves as a resource of the state. That's why I couldn't say that there is a real political nation in Russia, and that the, 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 there are real liberal people, the real liberal polit, polit, politicians in Russia. Who is that? I do not, do not know. Because if you ask the Russian liberal, about the Russian Empire, I'm absolutely sure that they will say, yes, of course, we want their freedom of expression, we need to press, we need the free election, but we should live in our, okay, they wouldn't use their world empire, but the geopolitical structure of Russia, they want to save it, I'm absolutely sure. And that is that that is the great problem and the great danger for us, for Ukraine, and for the whole free world. Because it's not only Putin. I say uh, always, we fight not against Putin. We fight against Russia. The Russian soldier. Let's go, let's, let's go back to the example of Chechnya. Uh, Chechnya was uh, now, of course, the, this was rather arbitrary because P P Chechnya was uh, an autonomous region even in the Soviet Union. And uh, it was uh, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, it was uh, Gorbachev uh, who who in the last part of the Soviet Union, the autonomous republics were elevated to the status of the Union republics. And on that basis, Chechnya claimed it had a legal right to declare its independence. Uh, and in fact, they had uh, a, a, a moral right under any circumstances because the Soviet Union itself was an illegitimate structure. But uh, to your point about the Russian people, at first, uh, the first, the Chechen war was generally supported by the Russian people. Uh, in um, and the, it began in December of 1994. Uh, in uh, March of 1996, uh, Alexander Lebed, who was, as you know, was a candidate for president, said that 30% of the soldiers in Chechnya are ready to turn their guns against the people who sent them there. And shortly afterward, for the first time, the majority of Russian people in opinion polls were saying that they wanted to leave, that they were ready to leave, pull out of Chechnya at any cost. 
In other words, they're basically ready to, to, to acknowledge defeat. Now, so we have to be careful about, uh, we can make generalizations about any country, but we have to be careful about assuming that, the, that our generalizations are, are permanently valid because situations change and the mentality of people is subject to various influences. We have to be aware of that, especially when we look at the situation today. The, there are forces that uh, the, there are forces that could make Russia even worse than it is right now. Uh, but they are not the only forces in the society. And uh, to a certain extent, uh, if we are not to be completely passive in this area, one of the things that we have, we can't just say, well, that the Russia is hopeless. We have to do what we can to support those forces that do exist that are, that are, that are reasonable. In fact, under circumstances in which if we take the territory of what is falsely called the Russian Federation, uh, there are not all territories, not all ethnic and national territories would want to separate for various complicated traditional and economic reasons. Some would, but it would not constitute the collapse of the entire country. There would still be a huge country with a very huge population and huge potential uh, if it's organized on a democratic basis. And a democratic Russia is not a threat to Ukraine. Uh, it's the, uh, so, so therefore this is kind of the goal that, that we have to keep in mind if we're talking about Russia. And I've said, and I've written, written about this, that the first step for Russia is a, a truth commission. And they began in the late Soviet period to expose the crimes of the Stalin era. And the, the, in fact, at one point, this was the driving force in the anti-communist revolution that took place in the Soviet Union, not just in Russia, but in Ukraine and elsewhere. Uh, there was a very active memorial society in Ukraine. Uh, but the, but uh, this lost all force after Yeltsin took power. Uh, but it did show the importance of historical memory. And that that task has to be renewed. Uh, and it has to apply not just to, to the Soviet period, but to the, to the crimes that have been committed in post-Soviet Russia. And on that, 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 those truths can become the basis for, you know, or ought to be the basis for a new constituent assembly and an attempt to create a kind of constitution for Russia. And this may, may be a utopian project, but on the other hand, it's a possible path forward. You know, Russia has to agree that those who want to leave the so-called federation, which by its nature implies a voluntary uh, association of people, that they have the right to do so. Under those circumstances, Russia ceases to be a threat to Ukraine. So how can the war in Ukraine have an effect on this possible process? Well, it, it's uh, you know, the, the, we don't see it now. We, we can't be sure, but I believe that under the surface, uh, Putin is being, and the Putin regime is being badly discredited by what's happening. And I believe also that there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of dislike and even hatred of that regime. People are not, they, they may not, they, the only thing that, that can, that can uh, cover it up is the appeal to so-called patriotism. And uh, once, and Russians will, you know, month by month, just as in the case of Chechnya, they're going to become aware of how they're being used. Uh, and after all, this is a small group of criminals, and they are using the Russians who are being sent to their deaths in Ukraine no less uh, than they are than they are using the or than they are uh, the, 
uh, using the Ukrainians uh, as, a, as 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 scapegoats for their own for their own uh, inability to rule the country uh, in a decent manner. Okay. First of all, I'm absolutely not sure that the Russia can be a real democratic state. That, that is well, no one is sure. No one is sure. This is, uh, but, but this is, uh, yeah. you know, but we don't, you know, we don't, we won't get that assurance anywhere. It, um, it, 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 the first, uh, the first point. The second one, I am not sure that even the Russian liberals are ready to recognize the Russian crimes against Ukraine, the Russian crimes against humanity, the Russian crimes against the Ukrainian people. You know, I am not sure. In this context, uh, it's interesting for me to, to observe the American point of view on the issue. And uh, it's very interesting. Today morning, I read the article uh, by Richard Haas, you know, the political expert, very famous and well known. Uh, the title of article, a world, uh, no, no, excuse me, the title, the title of article is diplomacy between Russia and the West still possible? And the question, even now, not after Putin, but now. And it's, uh, it's quotation. Yeah? One possibility for the West world be to link the entire relationship with Russia to Russians' actions in Ukraine. This would be a mistake though, because Russia can affect other Western interests, such as limiting the nuclear and missiles capabilities of Iran and North Korea, and the success of global efforts to limit the emissions that cause climate change. Yeah. So even now, yeah, even now, during the war, during the crimes against humanity on the territory of Ukraine, Richard Haas speaks about diplomacy about the negotiations about the communications with with, with russia regime with putin yeah and uh, it's, it's it's interesting to uh, to compare this article with the article of our poli political experts olga ivazovska well known in ukraine she published uh, this this article today also and the article the title of article is sooner or later putin will leave strategic mistakes of the West that can then can still be avoided. So it's like an answer on, on this article by Richard Haas. And I, I read the short quota quotation uh, from this article. The authoritarian state has committed an act of aggression against democratic Ukraine. Russian soldiers, not Putin personally, are committing war crimes, crimes against humanity, and an act of genocide in Ukraine. Russian society became an accomplice in the crime. Ignoring the fact is a prerequisite for strategically erroneous actions. Yeah. So I would say at the beginning of the war, yeah, it was a just different situation, but after Bucha, uh, you know that it's not, it's only one uh, city in a town, small town in Ukraine, but it's, it's like, a, like a sign for all these crimes. After that, how we can negotiate with, uh, with Russia in the normal way? I think it's impossible now. And I'm not well, sure. you know, Ukraine is nego is negotiating with Russia, and this is the the we can negotiate their defeat. Yeah, uh, we, you know, the the, uh, the 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 article by uh, that you by the by the American Richard Haas that you quote. This is typical American point of view, unfortunately. Uh, that uh, we have other things to worry, you know, to deal with as global partner, and of course we cannot forget about climate change, uh, as if uh, uh, this was somehow important. But um, the this uh, uh, this is not the reality. Um, the reality is that the this, the the outcome will be decided by force, uh, and. Uh, 
and the force must be on the side of the uh, victim of aggression and not the aggressor. Um, and the, uh, uh, so what, uh, the, 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 the regime must, the, the, the Russian regime, Russian regime must understand that they must liberate, that all territory of Ukraine that has been occupied must be liberated um, and the freed of their occupation and that they will be responsible for their crimes, not just Bucha, but Mar uh, they are in Mariupol. And, and I mean, this is just a long, we don't know how we don't know you right now the full extent of the of the horror that was unleashed by this criminal gang. But but uh, I would not. Uh, I think that this is dawning on people, and I would not be too concerned about what uh, so many of our uh, American pol you know, political commentators and political scientists have no real understanding of Russia. They think they understand something, uh, but they their understanding has been shaped by Russian disinformation, including the Valdai Discussion Club, where all of them go to get their understanding of Russia, and then they're 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 systematically disinformed. Were systematically disinformed. I think that the club has taken a break for the war, but um, the I don't think that that you know an article like that means much. Tell you the truth, even though it may seem to you in Kiev that it's uh, uh, it's just one one example of, among many. I mean, this was an un, this war was preventable. Of this course. war should never have taken place. We had many, many, many opportunities to stop them. Well, our first opportunity was 1999 after the apartment bombings. We have, you know, documents show that our State Department was well informed that this was a false flag attack mounted by the Russian FSB in order to guarantee Putin's accession to power. Well, that means a terrorist is in charge of nuclear weapons. We could have taken action then. And what about the, the murder, the, the Beslan, uh, the, uh, theater on, the theater on Dubrovka, uh, the murders of Anna Palatkovska, Boris Nemtsov, the shooting down of the Malaysian airliner, which was not carried out by the separatists. It was carried out by the Russians. It was their unit. They didn't hand those weapons over to those crazy separatists. They 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 fired the fatal shot, and so um, so so obviously they have to be defeated. They have to be defeated, and they have to be defeated decisively. And this is actually important for not just for Ukraine. It's important for Ukraine, of course. I did, uh, yeah, but it's important for Russia too. Believe it or not. The de defeat in this in in this cr criminal war can be the beginning of a positive evolution in Russia under some circumstances. Under some circumstances, it can cause a massive reevaluation, uh, and many of the the thoughts and feelings of people that are below the surface they can rise to the surface, and after all, someone needs to be responsible for the fate of these 20,000 or so young Russian soldiers, many of them have no idea why they're being sent to Ukraine. What, what you know, they're following orders. They feel they have no choice. They're 18, 19 years old. But believe me, it's not, it's not our problems. No? It's not a problem of Ukraine, but this, is, will be, this will be a factor in Russia. The, the, uh, we're, you and I are talking not just about Ukraine, we're talking also about the whole region and the the possible possible evolution because we hope someday there will not be a war. But and, I, propose, uh, I propose to go go back to this quotation uh, from an article by Richard Haas, and you say no. that the typical point of view in USA, and I think that it's it's a dangerous style of thinking, because as for me, is a style of thinking that. There are some great players in the world. USA, yes, okay. But Russia is also a great player. 
And the great players, so to speak, should decide the way of action and should, should decide their, the future of, of, of mankind, of humanity. I think that is a very dangerous style of thinking. Yeah, it's 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 uh, the especially uh, it greatly exaggerates the possible good that could come from contact. But the, many of these people, you have to understand also, you don't see this from a distance of Kiev. But for me, it's very obvious that you know, many of these people have made their careers on the, repeating this kind of of, yeah. of thing. And they are very slow to change their views. Many of them uh, uh, are now, of course, trying very hard to make people forget a lot of the things they said about Ukraine, about NATO, about Russia uh, in the years up until February 24th, 2022. But um, the reality on the ground, of course, is, is that, that um, Russia needs to be decisively defeated in all respects. And uh, there's no, and Russia has demonstrated quite clearly what should have been obvious right from the beginning. It should have been obvious when Yeltsin in 1993 dispersed the Russian parliament. I mean, Yeltsin was actually no better than Putin because the, the apartment bombings were undertaken in 1999 to save Yeltsin and save Yeltsin's family. I remember being told in Moscow, he said that Yeltsin was ready to blow up half of Moscow in order to preserve his corrupt family. So they, you know, these people who you are worried about, Vakdan, they've been, they have been, they have had their heads in the sand for uh decades. And now they're offering their theory about uh, the future of international relations. Reality will, 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 will dictate the conditions, not, not what they are saying and not their careers and not their self-justification. This I is hope, what's important. I hope so. But uh, of course, we, we face now a uh, very difficult time for everyone. And, uh, uh, and it's really important that we understand what and who we are dealing with. Those who, who constantly, you know, the Russia's, you know, we have, a, the thing that is, is so unusual about Russia is that it's, uh, one kind of country that is organized to give the impression that it's a completely different kind of country. And we often as Americans, being people who are rather superficial, we react uh, to the false version of Russia rather than the reality of Russia. But now we are exposed to, to the reality of Russia. What is happening in, 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 in Ukraine shows it. What happened in Bucha shows it. The bombardment of Mariupol shows it. And now we have to react accordingly. And I think that it's a great mistake in the United States and in, New York, in Europe as well to think that Russia is another kind of civilization. Yeah. This mistake is for me is rooted in, uh, in the uh, book by Arnold Toynbee, study of history. Yeah? There he uh, described the Russia as a um, Russia Orthodox uh, civilization. And as for me, Russia is not civilization at all. It's a shadow of European or Western uh, civilization. What, what does it mean? That shadow- did this, did this, this, yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what, this what, what goes I mean? to our discussion of Russian liberals. I mean, you know, no one explained this better than Pyotr Chadayev mm -hmm. in the 19th century he said this, you know, the, uh, the, everything, uh, we created nothing of our own. And everything we took from civilization, we distorted. And he also said that Russia exists 
in order to give the world a, a kind of terrible lesson. And there's a book also by, by Vladimir Maximov who says something similar, one of the called Seven, Seven Days of Creation. And one of the characters says, people, people curse us, but they should praise us. He says, we've taught the whole world how not to live. So uh, in this respect, uh, uh, this is correct, that it's not a separate civilization so much as a distortion of a, of, of a civilization. And it needs to, but it has the possibility to become part of Western civilization, I believe. And in any case, at least I hope so. Uh, and this, this is, should be the goal. This is, in any case, this is what we have to hope for. The defeat in the war in, in Ukraine is, it's important for both countries, actually. I'm, I'm afraid it is too optimistic to think that it's possible to make Russia the part of Western civilization. Uh, in, in these geopolitical borders and with this structure of uh, political, social, and structure of society, um, it's almost impossible as for me. Well, so, if it's possible, if, if it's possible at all, it will be possible only under conditions of complete and unambiguous defeat uh, in this war. But what, uh, does it, what does it mean? What, 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 what do you mean when you, see, when you say that it would, would be defeat of Russia? Uh, defeat of Russia is, I'm whole, sorry, yeah? The, the whole territory of Ukraine should be free. Yeah. Crimea. Yeah, from well, this is, this is a minim, minimum, uh, minimum. But the thing is, even if Ukrainian territory is liber, liberated, uh, that doesn't mean that immediately afterward the Western sanctions will be lifted. Far from it. I hope so. Uh, because in order, Russia has proven itself to be dangerous and uncivilized in its present form. And there were other pressures that will be brought to bear. We have unpredictable situation after defeat of Russia. And uh, I don't think I, you, I understand your, your, your skepticism, but, and you might be right, by the way. I mean, I'm not, uh, you know, it's, we, it's hard to, 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 to know for sure what's going to happen, but the hope is at least, and this will depend in part on, on the United States and on the West, that, uh, the pressures that can be brought to bear will lead to changes in Russia in conjunction with the thinking people who do exist there, uh, that a different kind of state can emerge and a different kind of political culture. We've seen glimpses of it in Russian history. It didn't last for long, but, but, but nonetheless, it occurred. And after all, let's face it, Communism was overthrown relatively nonviolently. Very as relatively. a result. <laughs> yeah. Hello, Olya. Yeah, hello. I really hate doing this, but we are running out of time. And thank you, dear gentlemen, for this conversation. I just want you, our listeners, to be aware that those were right, real sirens at the beginning of our conversation. And this is how the new Ukrainian reality looks. I feel very bad we haven't sent you to the shelter, Bakhtang, honestly, uh, because probably we should. We have one question, probably clarifying question from our regular listener, Tony and Tita. He was asking you, Bakhtang, he's asking that he's trying to understand, saying that Russian liberals like Navalny or the now exiled journalist of Dorch are um, uh, Professor Loss's work of Concordia, who is rapidly anti-invasion, are anti-Putin power plus corruption in the Federation, but secretly pro-annexation of Ukraine and the expansion of empire. Or what do you mean about your uh, with your statement about uh, Russian liberals? As, uh, as for me, uh, Russia, as I said, cannot be a real democratic uh, political nation. The only form of existence of Russia is empire. And Russian liberals, they understand that. They can say now, 
that they hate Putin, they hate their, this cr criminal gang, but if they come, they will try to support the empire. And it, 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 it will lead to the new, new way of aggression against Ukraine, against Georgia, against Moldova, Moldova, who knows, maybe Baltic countries or even Poland. Uh, yeah, for now we yeah for now we heard the war can uh, end only with reaching uh, Polish borders by Russian army right a couple of days ago so my Polish but friends were I'm really scared. Sure. I'm, I'm absolutely sure that it's not only issue of Putin yeah uh, it's issue of of the nature of the Russian state and that's why I'm not so optimistic that it's possible to after our after after our victory i'm sure that it, it will come but i'm not so optimistic that our after our victory it would be possible to to for russia to be a real democratic political nation yeah i think that you're right about we should definitely manage our expectations and having such a neighbor is to be always alarmed for yeah. sure and thank you for touching the ground of really complicated questions of understanding Russia and also was this war possibly avoidable or not? What about historical lessons? Are we able to learn from them at all or not? And thank you also, David, for your, this future looking optimistic idea of the possibility of reloading Russia as a state and a project replacing Rovsky Mir because this is probably one of the biggest, you know, mystery, it, mysteries if it's possible in general, right? But I'm pretty sure that we have now this luxury just to wait and check. We need to protect our, so our borders if they're geographical, political, or mental as well. And this is what our conversations are about, to try to find the answers to the questions, what can I do today to help? And today I'm back to the classical answer, awareness, and how especially important it is to reload this Kremlin agenda of seeing Ukraine only through the Russian lens. This is what is really very difficult to avoid. We are grateful to our partners for today, who are our Department of Press, Education and Culture of the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine, Traditional Pan America, the Ukrainian Institute, the Ukrainian Institute London, Ukraine World, the Harvard University Ukrainian Research Institute, and the Harman Institute at Columbia University. We are streaming today's event to all partners' Facebook pages and additionally to Gungadze Prize page. Gratitude, of course, to Pan Ukraine, which continues to stand at the front lines in the name of freedom and truth. And I want to remind you about the important fundraising initiative of Pan Ukraine member and poet Helena Krupp. We all switched to be full-time volunteers in those days, and she purchased drugs and tactical medicine supplies for field hospitals. You can find all the details in comments, and Ukraine need your help and donation. Pan Ukraine is Pan International is proud to be a platform without support freedom of expression. We don't necessarily agree with each word said, but this is exactly how freedom of expression works. Thank you, our great guests. Thank you. Uh, our viewers. The next episode will be held next week on Monday, 16th of May, 7 p.m. Kyiv time. We hope that with our sirens this time, 5 p.m. London time. Our guests will be Adam Kayan, Director of Rails Partners and author of Solving Tough Problems, Power and Love, Cooperation with the Enemy, and facilitate, Facilitating Breakthrough books, and Lubov Cebulska, a journalist and deputy director of the Hybrid Warfare Analytical Group of Ukraine Crisis Media Center. So I believe that we will proceed with a conversation about proven sources, fighting propaganda, and how to deal with all those absolutely unmanageable informational streams today. See you next Monday. Follow our dialogues and work. Spread the word and stand with Ukraine. This is our shared responsibility today. Thank you, Vahdan. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you.